Okay, so first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to London, even if you're only doing it via a computer screen. Uh, this presentation is just to say a little bit about what Logmore is about, or at least what I think it's about, and um, some logistic things for the week. So what, what's the point of this thing? Why have we all come to London now that the football is over? So one point of it is that we want machine learners and geometers to talk more to each other because we think that there's a lot of problems in machine learning, which geometry might be useful to solve. And from a point of view of geometers, it's a chance to learn some new problems which are related to their area and um, get a glimpse of a different kind of research. And so both sides, we hope, will benefit from this school. Um, speaking of interesting problems, um, there are some cool projects to do this week and each of you I'm sure will have a lot of fun with your project. And so having fun is an important goal of the school as well. So let me say who we are. My name's Tim King, I'm one of the organizers. Um, there are five organizers in total and you can hopefully see them. There's Mehdi, Barry, Guadalupe Gonzalez, Tim King, Montreal Konstantinov and Daniel Platt. And we need to thank various people. So we benefited from some very good advice from our scientific advisory committee, uh, which are professors Kevin Buzzard, Ron Kimmel and Max Welling. And we have a variety of sponsors. Uh, academic, we have Foundation Composito Mathematica, uh, the Imperial College London Science Student Chapter, the Heilbronn Institute and the LSGNT, and the IMA. And some commercial sponsors. Now we have Qualcomm, Speechmatics, Bosch, Gather, Adobe, Twitter, XTX Markets, Eigen Technologies, Arabesque, Relation Therapeutics, and Autodesk. Okay, so what, what's going to happen during the week? So the first thing are the projects, and I'll talk in more detail about those later. And there'll also be some talks. Again, I'll talk in more detail about those later. Uh, there are two, I've called them reading groups. They're more sort of tutorial sessions. There's one on um, geometry, and it's about um, simplicity or homology, and one on machine learning, which is about um, expressivity tests for GNNs. And we encourage you to go to those to learn a bit more about them. And the golden rule for all of these things is if you're not sure when they are, you can either look on Slack or the website. Uh, there's a woman in computing tutorial. That's already happened. It was a great success, I thought. Um, so thank you, Sarah Pariso and the Women in Computing Society for organizing that. Uh, later, I think it's on Thursday, um, but check the website. There's a panel discussion um, where some women in computing talk about how they got to be in that position. And um, there's a social attached to that event as well. It's not the only social event. There are other social events. There's a uh, a mystery escape room to be unlocked at some point on Gather Town, and a variety of other things as well, including a pub quiz. Uh, there's a company night. Um, some of the companies that sponsored us will deliver presentations and be around for questioning about their company and what it is they do and how they use machine learning and geometry in their day-to-day -day life. And this evening, there's a poster session where we can all learn about each other's work, and that's on Gather Town. Okay, logistics. So we're gonna use three platforms for this. One is Zoom, which we're all using now. And there's a messaging service called Slack and there's Gather Town, which is for the company presentation and poster session and some social events. And the golden rule is um, if you're not sure how any of these work, look on Slack. Of course, that might not be so useful if you're not sure how Slack works, but in that case, you can check your emails hopefully. Ah, I've preempted myself, there's the golden rule. Okay, projects. So you should already know which project you're doing. And most of the mentors have been in touch with their mentees, we notice. Um, we're sure, hopefully those who haven't will do so soon. And the point of these projects is to learn something new. Um, it may or may not be useful for your research, but the, the main point is to expand your horizons, learn something new, have some fun. So we help in the following way. We provide a Slack channel and a Zoom link 
But aside from that, we don't, that's essentially all the help we provide. Uh, it's up to you and your mentor to do as you wish with your project. And I hope you'll have a lot of fun. Although I say, um, if there are any questions or issues, you are very welcome to talk to the organizers and we will try to help. Uh, the website has times for, which are suggested that you can work on your project because um, there are projects across different time zones. It's not obligatory. Um, you can decide amongst yourselves when to work. These are just suggestions. Ah, your group will give a five minute presentation on Friday. Notice that it says five minutes and no more. We will be quite strict on time because there's lots of people. And you can, if you wish, uh, continue working on the projects after Friday, um, but that's not required. It's not, we, do, we don't expect it, um, but you can if you want. Talks, uh, rules for talks, they're on Zoom. Uh, we encourage, but we don't require you to have your camera on. That's because it gets a little lonely uh, for the speaker if they're just talking to a laptop. And we also encourage you at the end of your talk, if the talk was good, uh, to unmute yourselves and applaud. I think that's better than clicking the applaud emoji on Zoom. Um, I noticed some of you have turned your camera on at that comment, so thank you very much. That's very appreciated. Each talk will have its own Slack channel where you can ask questions. And if you want to continue discussing a particular talk after the talk's over, you can because the channel will continue to exist. However, once a talk's ended, then there'll be a new talk, unless it's the final talk of the day, and we'll then move to a new channel. So this is so that different questions between different talks don't get mixed up. Um, some talks might have a lot of questions, and it will be up to the chair to decide which questions will be asked at the end of the talk. So please no questions during the actual talk, but if you want to ask something, po post it in the Slack channel and the chair may select it. Uh, to help the chair select questions, if there are a lot, you can thumbs up or upvote questions on Slack that you think are good questions and should be asked. And last rule before I uh, hand over is uh, just be nice. Um, there's a code of conduct on the website, um, please help everyone feel comfortable. It's a fun event. Um, yeah, and, and if if you do run into trouble or you think someone is uh, not behaving in a good way, uh, we will try and help if you contact us. So that, that's almost all. Just, just have some fun. Um, you can tweet your experiences or um, share them if you like by uh, using this Twitter information. So it's at logmall2021, hashtag logmall. Uh, feel free to do that if you'd like, we'd appreciate it. Um, aside from that, let me uh, check with my colleagues. Is there anything I should have said but I've forgotten to say? No, and does anybody have any questions? If so, uh, unmute yourself or, or raise your hand. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Uh, so we have uh, three brilliant speakers today. Uh, I will hand over to Mehdi, my co-organizer, who will introduce the, uh, the first speaker uh, for today. So thank you all. Hello. Hello. Okay, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so thank you, Tim, for uh, the brilliant remarks. Um, so as a reminder, uh, we will take questions on Slack uh, at the end of the talk. So please join uh, the channel Keynote01 if you haven't done already. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker. Uh, he is a professor at Imperial College London, where he holds the chair in machine learning, machine learning and pattern recognition and the head of graph learning uh, research at Twitter, a pioneer of geometric deep learning, whose work has been widely adopted both in academia and industry. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Bronstein. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mehdi, and thank you everyone for the invitation. I hope you can hear me well, and it's unfortunate that I cannot be with you physically, so I will be speaking to my screen and uh, see some faces on it. So um, I would like to talk today about geometric deep learning. So as uh, Mehdi 
mentioned, this is one of the research topics that I'm particularly interested in. And uh, what I will be presenting today is uh, based on a book that I'm writing with uh, Joan Bruna, Taco Coin, and Petar Vilich, which you can find uh, more details on the website, geometricdeeplearning.com. So um, maybe I should start with apologizing that if you've seen this talk at iClear, this will be just a pale shadow because I don't have that level of professional graphics that, that was put in, into that, that lecture. But nevertheless, let me maybe start with explaining uh, what I mean by geometric. And for this purpose, uh, forget about being in London. We are now traveling back in time and in space. So we are going to, to ancient Greece where uh, modern geometry originated. So, and uh, we uh, need to meet uh, Euclid that lived uh, more than 2000 years ago. And uh, since his fundamental work, uh, basically that was the only geometry that we knew, Euclidean geometry. And uh, in the beginning of uh, the 19th century, uh, there was this sudden burst of creativity that, that ended Euclid's monopoly and different kinds of geometries were constructed. So the works of Lobachevsky, Boyei, Gauss, Riemann, and others uh, created an entire zoo of different geometries where the, the, the basic assumptions, the postulates of Riemannian geometry didn't hold. And it was not even clear what defines a geometry and uh, how to classify different geometries. And a solution was proposed by uh, Felix Klein. He was uh, only 23 years old when he was appointed as a full professor at the University of Erlangen in, in Bavaria in Germany. So this is a quite unprecedented feat even by, by modern standards. And um, he was asked, as it was customary in Germany, to deliver a lecture about his, uh, his research program. So uh, unlike what the legend says, it, actually he never gave this uh, talk about his research program, but he published a, a small booklet that entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program. And the idea of Erlangen program was pretty radical. So he proposed uh, defining a geometry as um, the, the, the kind of properties that remain unchanged under some class of transformations. So basically it's the study of invariants and symmetries. And uh, this approach uh, immediately gave clarity about uh, uh, what is different geometries, how they are related to each other, and allowed also to define new geometries. And it was formalized using the language of group theory. So these ideas were very uh, profound in mathematics. So you can, uh, you can trace the origins of category theory, for example, to the Erlangen program. And uh, in particular, they are extremely uh, impactful in physics, where, for example, Amy Neuter, who was a colleague of, uh, of Klein, showed that, that you, can, uh, you can derive conservation laws from first principles of symmetry. So uh, something that was only empirically observed in experiments now could be mathematically rigorously proved. And this idea uh, under what is called gauge uh, invariance that was first introduced by Hermann Weil, but then developed by Young and Mills uh, in the 50s, uh, proved successful to, uh, in unifying the fundamental forces of nature with the exception of gravity. This is what uh, uh, was given the name of standard model. And again, with the exception of gravity, that's all the physics that we currently know that we can derive entirely from first principles of symmetry. And that's why it, it is only slightly overstating the cause to say that, that physics is the study of symmetry. But you can wonder at this point, what does it all have to do with uh, deep learning, right? And uh, I think deep learning uh, it, it nowadays reminds a lot the situation uh, in geometry in the 19th century that on the one hand, I think no one has a slight shadow of a doubt that uh, deep learning brought in a re revolution in data science and many tasks such as computer revision, speech recognition, natural language translation that might have appeared uh, all science fiction 20 years ago are now uh, possible. But on the other hand, we have this, uh, again, this zoo of different architectures, different designs of neural networks, but very few unifying principles. And as a consequence, it is hard to understand uh, relations between different methods. There is a lot of reinvention and rebranding. So we need some form of uh, unification, and that's exactly what we call a geometric deep learning. And basically, this is uh, a common mathematical framework that allows us to derive uh, neural network architectures from first principles. And basically, it's uh, also a constructive procedure for 
future yet to be invented architectures uh, to incorporate uh, inductive biases. So we popularized uh, this term geometric deep learning in a paper that I co-authored with Jean Brunner and others uh, 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 published in 2017 in the IEEE Signal Processing Magazine. Now it's almost synonymously used with graph neural networks, but I hope to show you today that uh, it's part of a much broader picture. And uh, for this purpose, let's look at maybe the, the, the naive and classical setting of machine learning, supervised learning, we're looking at the problem of binary classification. So the typical example that you will be shown is you have inputs that look like images of cats and dogs, and you want to classify these images, right? So basically, mathematically speaking, we're uh, given outputs of some unknown function on a training set of these uh, uh, cat and dog images. And we try to find a function from some hypothesis class that fits well with the training data. And it allows us to predict the outputs on previously unseen inputs. And uh, essentially, it's, it's a function estimation problem, maybe a glorified one. And what happened uh, in the past decade is that two trends coincided. So first of all, the availability of large high quality data sets such as ImageNet with millions of annotated images, and also the growing computational power, in particular, the use of GPUs. And it allowed to uh, design rich function classes that can, at least in principle, interpolate such uh, data sets and neural networks appeared to be a suitable choice because neural networks, as we all know, even with very simple architectures such as uh, multi layer perceptrons, can represent uh, any continuous function. So, this is a property that we call uh, universal approximation. Now, the setting of this problem has been studied very well in approximation theory, so we have a lot of results. But the problem is that most of these results are valid only for low dimensional cases, and the situation is entirely different and much less sympathetic in, in high dimensions. So we can quickly see that standard notions of regularity, such as, for example, if we take Lipschitz continuous functions, uh, if we increase the dimension in which these functions are defined, we need to, uh, to take an exponential number of samples in order to approximate these functions with uh, accuracy, desired accuracy, let's say, epsilon. And uh, this is a phenomenon that is uh, known as the curse of dimensionality. And the high dimension is not just a bug, it's a feature, it's, uh, it's omnipresent in machine learning problems because they need to deal with data, not in two or three dimensions, but in thousands or even millions of dimensions. So the naive approach, the standard notions of regularity that exist in function approximation theory are not uh, appropriate for these kind of problems. And um, this is probably best seen in computer vision, where, uh, for example, if you want to do image classification, even very tiny images, such as MNIST digits, are very high dimensional. So in this example, they're approximately 1,000 dimensional. And if we just think of them as vectors that are then passed to a neural network, we see that we throw away a lot of structure. Basically, we break the geometric regularity of the, of the image. And now, if I just shift my image by just one pixel, I will need to show a lot of examples to the network because the, the, the input vectors, the vectorized images will be very different. And um, the remedy for this problem in computer vision, as you probably know, came from uh, works in neuroscience where it was shown that, that the, the neurons in the, the, the human uh, brain visual cortex are organized into what is called local receptive fields. And this inspired a new kind of architectures called neocognitrons developed by Fukushima. Uh, and uh, of course, the classical work of Jan Lekan, convolutional neural networks, where this concept of weight sharing across the image allowed to effectively solve the, the curse of dimensionality. But we have other types of data. So this is uh, a graph that represents a molecule, a molecule of caffeine. And let's say that we want to predict some chemical or physical property of this molecule, which is a very standard problem in, uh, for example, designing new drugs or designing new materials. So what we see in this case that we don't have a, a canonical way of ordering the nodes. We can reshuffle them in any way we want, right? Unlike images where we still had some uh, canonical lexicographic column stacking way, for example, for organizing images in graphs, we don't. And graphs are just one example. We have many other instances of such uh, uh, irregular non-Euclidean data whether it's social networks, uh, intractomes, different biological networks, meshes in computer graphics, and so on and so forth. So let us look again at this um, example of um, uh, dimensionality, dimensionality cursed uh, problem that at the first glance seemed to be hopeless, right? We are talking about image classification. Fortunately, 
we do have additional structure that comes from the geometry of the input signal. And uh, we call this structure a geometric prior, and as we'll see, it's a very general and powerful principle that uh, allows us actually to address uh, dimensionality curse problems. And this is what really makes machine learning work in practice. And in our example of classifying images, the input image is not just a d-dimensional vector. It's a signal defined on some domain that in this case is a two-dimensional grid. And the structure of this grid can be described by a symmetry group. So in this case, typically it's uh, the group of two-dimensional translations. Uh, and acting on the points on the domain, the, the action of the group is manifested in the space of signals that are defined on, on this grid through what is called the group representation. So to make this example very concrete, in our case, it's simply the shift operator, a D by D matrix that acts on the D-dimensional vector that represents the image. And this geometric structure of the domain that underlies the input signal imposes structure in its turn on the class of functions F that we are trying to learn. So the image classifiers, for example. And we can have uh, functions that are unaffected by the action of the group, uh, what we call invariant functions. So for example, no matter where the cat is located in this image, we still want to say that this is a cat. So this is a example of shift invariance. And uh, if on the other hand, the input and the output have the same structure, like in image segmentation problems, we want the output to be transformed in exactly the same way as the input. So what we call shift equivariance. Another principle that we have in images and in other applications is what uh, is called, uh, called scale separation. So in some cases we can construct a multi-scale hierarchy of our domains by assimilating nearby points and uh, producing also a hierarchy of signal spaces that are related by some coarse graining operator. And on these coarse scales, we can apply coarse scale functions and think of, for example, classifying images uh, at different levels of resolution. And in this case, we can define locally stable functions that can be approximated as the composition of this coarse graining operator and the coarse scale function. And uh, in, uh, uh, in these good functions, uh, we can separate the, 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 the long range in interaction across different scales. And these two principles give us a very general blueprint that we call geometric deep learning. You can recognize it probably in the majority of popular deep neural architectures. We usually apply a sequence of equivariant layers, such as convolutional layers and CNNs. And then sometimes an invariant global pooling layer that aggregates everything into a single output, for example, image classification problems. And in some cases, we also have a hierarchy of domains created by some coursing procedure that takes the form of local pooling. And this is a very general design. It can be applied to different types of geometric structures, obviously grids. We can also apply it to homogeneous spaces with uh, global transformation groups, such as the sphere, for example. We can apply it to graphs, to sets, and to manifolds. So we call this the 5G of geometric deep learning. And the implementation of these principles can be found in some of the most popular architectures uh, now in existence, whether it's CNNs, that can be derived entirely from the considerations of translational symmetry, graph neural networks, deep sets, transformers that implement permutation invariants and other maybe more exotic forms of uh, uh, representation learning such as intrinsic and mesh CNNs. So let me showcase these principles with graphs. And uh, for graphs, I think it's uh, a convenient analogy would, would, would be to think of a social network where we have users that are represented as nodes of the graph the uh, relations between them, or let's say friendship relations, will be modeled as edges. And let's assume that we also have some features that are attached to each node. So let's say we model some demographic properties of the users of the social network. So one important thing that we need to, to understand about graphs and sets, this is really their key structure characteristic, is that we don't have a canonical way to order their nodes. So when I number the nodes of this graph in this slide, I'm really cheating because I have many ways of doing it, right? But this numbering is convenient because it allows me to organize the uh, node features into a matrix, right? And same way I can describe the structure of the graph in the form of adjacency matrix. And again, uh, all these structures, the feature matrix and the adjacency matrix would depend on how I decided to number the nodes of the graph. So I can describe this ambiguity by uh, a permutation. So I denoted by P here, it's a permutation matrix that reorders the rows of the feature matrix or the rows and the columns of the adjacency matrix. And if we want to implement a function on the graph that let's say provides a single output for the entire graph, like in our example of uh, predicting properties of molecules, uh, 
we want to make sure that the output is unaffected by the arbitrary ordering of the input nodes. So in other words, this is a permutation invariant function. If on the other hand, we want to, to solve a task where we are dealing with node-wise predictions, such as, for example, classifying uh, bad users on a social network, or maybe we are using this equivariant layer as an intermediate computation in our uh, graph neural network, we want a function that changes in the same way as the input with the ordering of the nodes, or in other words, it's a permutation equivariant function. So the standard way of constructing uh, such functions, so it's not exactly all possible functions, but it's a pretty broad class uh, that is computationally tractable is using uh, uh, local neighborhood. So we're looking at the, the feature vectors of nodes that are connected by an edge to, to every node uh, in the graph. And we collect their feature vectors into what is called the multi-set. And uh, I remind you that the aggregation of these features must be done in a permutation invariant way because we don't have canonical ordering of the neighbors. So if we apply this function to every node of the graph, the uh, representation of the nodes that, that we obtain in this way will be permutation equivariant. You can easily see that if I reorder the, uh, uh, the, the, the nodes of the graph, then the output of each phi will remain the same because the aggregation itself, the local aggregation is permutation invariant, but the order in this matrix uh, will be uh, the same, uh, changed in the same way as the, 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 the input nodes. So the choice of this, uh, of this local aggregation uh, the, that I denote by phi is extremely important to the expressive power. And when this phi is injective, uh, it was actually shown that the neural network that is designed in this way is equivalent to the vice versa lemon graph isomorphism test. So it's a classical algorithm in graph theory that tries to determine if two graphs are isomorphic by uh, some kind of iterative label refinement uh, procedure. So we say that two graphs are isomorphic if, uh, if we can represent them with the, the adjustment matrices I denoted by A and A prime, and uh, there exists an edge preserving bijection between them, which we can think of as reordering one of the adjustments into, uh, into another one, such that they're equal. And the vice versa uh, lemon algorithm uh, starts with all the nodes of the graph having the same color. So these are discrete labels that are attached to, to each node. And it applies an injective function to the, to the neighbor colors. And this function it has exactly the same structure as the function phi that we defined before. Because it's injective, it allows to distinguish between differently structured neighborhoods. So in this example, we started with nodes that have three neighbors or two neighbors that now become uh, two distinct colors, uh, yellow and green. We can apply this procedure again, and now we have three different colors, but a further refinement will not change the colors. So at this point, we can output the histogram of colors, and this is a graph descriptor. So if I now give you a new graph and I get a different histogram, I can for sure say that the graphs are not isomorphic, but if the descriptors are the same, we actually don't know. So in other words, it's a necessary but insufficient condition and in fact, we can easily find examples of graphs that will be deemed equivalent by the vice versa lemon test, but they are not isomorphic, like the example that is shown here. So the typical way that we do this local aggregation uh, in graphs usually has the following form. So we have a permutation invariant aggregation operator. Typically, it's a sum or a maximum. We have a learnable function psi that transforms the neighbor features, and another function phi that updates the features of uh, each node uh, using the aggregated uh, uh, neighbors. And there are lots of nuances uh, in how these uh, components are designed. So it's a very active research topic in deep learning on graphs. Uh, but fortunately, most architectures can be classified into the following three flavors. So the first one is convolutional flavor. And in this setting, we aggregate neighbor features in uh, weighting them by some coefficients that depend only on the structure of the graph. And uh, this can be uh, interpreted as a kind of importance of node J to the representation of node I. And I will show you in a few minutes that it actually boils down to the classical convolutional grids. The second flavor is based on attention. I think arguably this is one of the most popular instances of graph neural networks where we aggregate with coefficients that are now not only dependent on the structure of the graph, but also on the features themselves. And the most general flavor is what is called message passing, where we have uh, a nonlinear function that can be interpreted as a message that is sent from node J to the node I, and is used to, to update the representation of this node. 
So if you look at typical architecture of graph neural networks, uh, you can hopefully recognize an instance of our geometric deep learning blueprint. Now we use the permutation group as our geometric prior, and we typically have a sequence of permutation equivariant layers. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as propagation or diffusion layers, or an optional global pooling layer that produces a single graph-wise output. And uh, we might also, in some settings, have uh, local pooling layers that are obtained using some form of graph coarsening that can also be learnable. So it is interesting and instructive to look at some uh, special cases of graph neural networks, and one of them is working with sets. So we can think of sets as graphs where we remove all the edges. So the, 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 the structural property that set in here, sets inherit from graphs is being unordered. And in this case, the most straightforward approach would be to process each element of the set entirely independently of the others. We just apply a shared function phi to their feature vectors. And uh, essentially, it's a special case of a graph neural network uh, with empty edges. So this architecture is called deep set and deep learning or point net in computer graphics. Another extreme case, we can say that, OK, we have a set. Instead of assuming that each node is treated independently, we can assume that any pair of nodes can interact. So in this case, this becomes a complete or a fully connected graph. And in this case, actually, the convolutional flavor makes no sense, because if you write this aggregation, basically, the second argument will be shared across all nodes, so it will be useless. We should use at least the, the attention-based aggregation. And now we can interpret it as a form of learnable soft adjustancy matrix. And I hope you can recognize the, the famous transformer architecture that has now become very popular, in, especially in uh, natural language processing applications. It is also a form of uh, graph neural network. So here, I'm probably also cheating a little bit because transformers are really applied not to general graphs, but to sequences. And in sequences, we do have order of nodes. And typically, this order information is provided in the form of what is called positional encoding. So it's extra features that are attached to the nodes, typically sine waves that allow to uniquely identify the nodes. And similar approaches have been also used for general graphs. So there are multiple ways you can do positional encoding on graphs. So here I'm presenting one way that was developed by my PhD students, Georgos Burises and Fabrizio Frasca, where we count small graph substructures, such as triangles and clicks. And we think of them as a kind of structural encoding that, that allows to, to specialize the message passing mechanism to different neighborhoods. And uh, this architecture that we call graph subtraction network can be made strictly more powerful than the vice fair element test by uh, choosing the right substructures. And we can also uh, think of it as a kind of problem specific and active bias. So if you take organic chemistry as an example, the prominent structures there are cycles. Like in this, uh, again, this uh, molecular graph of caffeine, we have cycle of length five and cycle of length six. So if we count these uh, structure, these structures, we get uh, significantly better performance in, for, for example, predicting chemical properties of organic molecules. So it is interesting that, that uh, basically there is nothing especially uh, sacrosanct about the input graph. Even when we don't have any graph, we can still use graph neural networks. And uh, it's a good question, actually, do we need to stick to the original graph to do message passing? And uh, many results in the literature indicate that this is probably not the case. And uh, there are many forms of uh, rewinding the graph, whether in the form of sampling or some form of smoothing the graph, or maybe using uh, multi-hop filters. So we don't need to look at the neighbors. We maybe can uh, look at the neighbors of the neighbors. So uh, it is pretty active uh, research field. And uh, I think there is no clear answer of what is the right graph to do message passing. I should say that we can also make this graph learnable. Uh, we can uh, define it in, in a way that is optimal for the downstream tasks. So usually this setting is called latent graph learning. And we can make it differentiable and back propagate through it. And the graph can be updated throughout the layers of the graph neural network. So the, the, one of the early instances of this architecture is uh, dynamic graph CNNs that we developed together with the group of Justin Solomon uh, at MIT. So uh, maybe in historical perspective, so there is interesting relation between this uh, instance of graph neural networks, uh, latent graph learning, and uh, nonlinear dimensionality reduction methods that are called manifold learning. And uh, the, the, the main uh, assumption uh, of these methods is that our data might uh, live in a very high dimensional space, but there is some low intrinsic dimensionality of the data. So the, so the metaphor that is typically presented is 
that you can think of a low dimensional manifold embedded in a very high dimensional space and your data is somehow sampled from this manifold. So in other words, there is a small number of degrees of freedom with which you can approximate uh, uh, the variability of your data set. And uh, it was common to, to think of basically the, the capturing the structure of this manifold uh, in the form of a uh, nearest neighbor graph. And then you will try to embed it into low dimensional space where it would be easier to do machine learning. Typically it was clustering. And the reason why these methods never really took off for practical applications because all these three steps were completely separate from each other. And you can obviously imagine that the way that I, I build the graph and the way I embed it into low dimensional space hugely affects the output of, uh, the, the, of the machine learning that I apply to it. So with modern uh, deep learning pipelines, I can fold all these steps into a single architecture where I learn the graph and the filters that I apply on this graph in one step. So this is a graph neural network with latent graph structure. And uh, with collaborators from Munich, the group of Nasir Nawab and uh, Anis Kazi, who is uh, also one of the instructors in, in, in this um, uh, uh, at LogML, uh, we developed an architecture that uh, we called differential graph module or DGM, and we applied it successfully for automatic diagnosis of uh, neurological uh, diseases. So this is what I had to say about graphs. Let's still remain, uh, let's still talk about graphs, but a particular kind of graphs uh, that are grids. So we can also think of grids as graphs uh, of very particular structure. And one thing that we notice in grids compared to general graphs is that the neighborhood structure of each node is exactly the same. Not only that, the order of the neighbors uh, is prescribed. And unlike general graph where we had to do permutation variant aggregation of the neighbors, now we don't need to do it, right? Now we can order the neighbors and this aggregation, for example, if we use a linear aggregation function, we get the classical convolution. So if I represent my convolution as a matrix, I get a matrix with a very special structure, which can be obtained by taking a vector and cyclically shifting it, right? So the, the rows or the columns of this matrix are obtained as shifted copies of a single vector of parameters. So this is called circulant matrix. And this vector of parameters is exactly the shared weights of convolutional neural networks that I mentioned in the beginning. So circulant matrices are really fascinating because they are very special. So they, for example, commute, unlike general matrix multiplication. And in particular, they commute with a special circulant matrix that cyclically shifts the elements of a vector by one position. So this is the shift operator that I mentioned in the beginning when we discussed uh, uh, group representation. So circuit matrices commute with shift, which is just another way of saying that convolution is shift equivariant operation. And this statement works in both directions. We can actually uh, define convolutions as uh, linear operations that are shift equivariant. And you can see here the power of our geometric approach that unlike the, the, the typical way convolution is shown uh, in signal processing or in deep learning uh, as a formula out of the blue with maybe a little bit of hand waving uh, you can actually derive it uh, entirely from the considerations of translational symmetry. And uh, here's an, uh, another nice thing that you can also derive the Fourier transform from exactly the same considerations. Basically, you can consider it as eigenvectors of uh, the, the shift operator or any circuit matrix because uh, uh, commuting matrices are jointly diagonalizable. So this duality between convolution in the frequency domain and the spatial domain also comes from the same considerations of symmetry. So if we think of our convolution as this kind of sliding window operation, right? So circuit matrices, you can think of it as applying the same shared weight uh, at different positions of the, uh, of the image. Uh, we can slightly formalize it with uh, basically having a, a shift operator that moves our filter around, right? So I denote the filter here by Psi, and then inner product that matches it to the image that I denote by X. So if we, compute this inner product for every position of the filter, we get the convolution, right? Now, there is a little bit of cheating because this is uh, a very special case. Here we actually can identify the translation group with the domain itself, right? So I can think of uh, the shift, uh, the, the element of the shift group of the translation group as a position to which I'm shifting the, the filter. But in general, this is not necessarily the case, right? In general, we have uh, a group representation in the row, and we need to compute this inner product for every element of the group. 
right? And let me show you how it works, for example, on the sphere. So in this case, uh, the domain is a sphere, so it's a two-dimensional manifold. I can represent it as unit vectors uh, in R3. And the, 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 the group here will be the special orthogonal group, SO3. So we can represent it as matrices, uh, orthogonal matrices with determinant equal to one. So it's rotations preserving orientations. So the convolution here, the output of the convolution, we need to take it for every rotation. So it is defined on SO3. And SO3 is, uh, it's a Lie group, if you're familiar with this concept, it's a three-dimensional manifold. So it has a very different structure from the input domain itself. And if you want to apply another layer of convolutional neural network on this sphere, the next layer must be applied not on this sphere, but on SO3. So the points now on this domain will be rotations. So in this example, uh, the sphere is a uh, non-Euclidean space, right? So it's manifold. The SO3 is also a manifold, but it, it is still quite special. So in, in this case, every point can be transformed into another point by an element of, of the symmetric group of rotations. So I can rotate any U into any V, right? So in a sense, there is complete democracy among the points. And in geometry, such spaces are called homogeneous. The, the key feature is that the, the symmetry group uh, uh, acts transitively. So we have global symmetry structure. And this is obviously not the case for general manifolds. And if we compare convolution and images and manifolds, one thing that we can notice in images is that uh, if I think again of this kind of sliding window operation, it doesn't matter which way I move the filter, right? If I move it along the, the, the blue path or the green path, I will get it to exactly the same result. On the manifold, because of curvature, it is not the case. Right? So you, you can see that if I move along the green path or if I long, uh, move along the, the, the blue path, I will arrive at a very different result. Right? And in differential geometry, we call this parallel transport. And roughly speaking, the result of moving a vector is path dependent. Right? So one thing that you need to understand about manifolds that unlike uh, grids or, or Euclidean space, where we have a global system of coordinates, Manifolds are only locally Euclidean. So we can take a small neighborhood of a point and map it to uh, what is called the, the tangent space. And the, the tangent space can be equipped with extra structure, an inner product that is called the Riemannian metric. It allows us to measure angles, uh, length, and uh, volume. And if we deform this manifold without affecting the metric, uh, we say that it's an isometric deformation. So isometries also form a group. And uh, we can define uh, an analogy of convolutional like filters on the manifold in an intrinsic way, basically expressed entirely in terms of the metric. And as a result, this operation will be invariant to deformations. And uh, in fact, some of the first ways of doing this kind of convolutions, uh, we call them geodesic CNN. So they used a special construction, was a form of discretization of the, the exponential map on the manifold. Now I'm still cheating here because uh, what I didn't say is that we are forced to work locally on the manifold. We don't have this luxury of having a global system of coordinates. So we need to fix some local frames at each point, what physicists call a gauge. And this construction is entirely arbitrary. So I can change the gauge uh, by uh, what is called the gauge transformation. Depends on how much structure and you assume on my manifold. But if I have a Riemannian manifold, uh, I can transform the gauge by an orientation preserving rotation. Uh, SO2, if it's two-dimensional manifold. And we need to account for the effect of the gauge transformation on the filter by making it transform in the same way. So the filter is gauge equivariant. And there was an entire theory of gauge equivariant convolutional networks that uh, was uh, developed by, uh, by Taco Cohen uh, from the group of Max Welling. He's uh, my co-author in the, the, the geometric deep learning book. So you can see here again and again, the same geometric deep learning blueprint it comes either in the form of invariance to so the isometric group, basically deformation uh, invariance, or equivariance so to what, technically speaking, is called the structure group of the tangent bundle uh, of this manifold. And uh, you may wonder why at all we are uh, interested in machine learning and these exotic things, manifolds. Uh, one of the reasons is that we do care about manifolds in applications in computer vision and graphics where surfaces or two-dimensional manifolds typically discretized as meshes are a standard way of modeling 3D objects. So you model boundaries of three-dimensional volumes as two-dimensional surfaces. And what we gain from this geometric perspective is that we can now, we have a way of defining filters intrinsically on the object. So uh, as a result, they will be invariant to, to deformations. 
and many important deformations such as articulations of a human body or human face are approximately isometries. And uh, one application where dealing with these deformable objects is crucial is what is called motion capture or mock-up. Uh, you might have seen it in the production of expensive blockbusters such as Avatar. And what you see here is a cheap markerless motion capture setup from uh, a Swiss company called FaceShift that was acquired by Apple six years ago. And uh, it is now technology that powers the Animoji feature on uh, the recent generations of the iPhone. So what this video nicely shows is uh, two prototypical problems in computer vision. The problem of shape analysis, where we are given the, the noisy face scan of an actor in this case that is captured by the 3D sensor. We need to bring it to, into correspondence with uh, some canonical face model. And on the other hand, we have the problem of synthesis, where we need to deform this model to reproduce the input expression of the actor. And uh, 10 years ago, uh, one would need a 3D sensor to produce this motion capture effect. And I should say that I myself was very adamant about it. And uh, since there were no really uh, cheap real-time sensors with sufficient resolution, so think that Kinect uh, just appeared and it didn't have uh, sufficient resolution to capture, for example, facial expressions, we had to build one. So that was uh, a startup that, that I co-founded called uh, InVision. And here you can see a video from 2011. So this was uh, one of the early prototypes of this sensor uh, running on FPGA. So InVision was acquired by Intel in 2012. I spent uh, the following nearly eight years building what is now called the, the Intel RealSense technology. And uh, it was released in 2014 with this funny commercial uh, with a character from the Big Bang Theory. And it was uh, the first mass manufactured integrated 3D sensor that was commercially successful for Intel. Don't tell anyone what you see. So it was quite a humbling experience to see it uh, uh, in the US uh, broadcast on a big screen in, in a bar around Christmas as an advertisement. But uh, fast forward 10 years, we don't need 3D input anymore for uh, uh, something similar to that motion capture video. We can actually have hybrid geometric deep learning architectures where the input is a standard 2D uh, CNN that can be applied to, to standard uh, image or input uh, or video input. And the, uh, the, the, the output is produced by a, a geometric um, mesh CNN uh, that, that allows, for example, to reconstruct the face or the, the pose of the hand uh, accurately in 3D. And uh, this was the work of uh, a PhD student, uh, Dominique Coulon. And uh, at last year, CVPR, we presented um, uh, a demo of full body 3D avatars with detailed hands from purely 2D video uh, input that ran uh, 10 times faster than real time on uh, iPhone. And that was a collaboration with a startup company called the Real AI that was acquired by uh, Snap last year. So I cannot really take uh, much credit here besides convincing one of the founders, Yasos Kokinos, who is a colleague and good friend, to leave his highly paid job at Facebook and to do this startup. And uh, I also invested. Uh, at early stage in, in, in the company. Which probably brings me to uh, the right time to talk about some interesting applications of geometric deep learning. And uh, this is really the fun part because I think these methods have now matured into technology that can really transform a lot of interesting applications. And in particular, I'm excited about applications of deep learning on graphs because graphs are really ubiquitous abstract ways of modeling practically any system of relations and interactions, well, let's say pairwise relations and interactions, whether it's uh, molecular graphs, whether it's uh, biological interaction networks, uh, uh, all the way to the macro scale to, to social networks like Twitter or Facebook that, that capture interactions of users at the entire, uh, at the entire uh, global scale. And one thing that, that you will probably hear prominently in relation to, to uh, social networks is the, the, the problem of uh, so-called fake news or misinformation. And there is uh, empirical evidence that the way that fake news spread on a social network has uh, certain particular characteristics. And we try to use uh, graph neural networks to detect uh, misinformation by looking at their spreading pattern on the social network. In particular, we use Twitter. And uh, we got quite encouraging results. So together with my students, I founded a startup company we called uh, Fabuli AI that 
commercialize this technology. And uh, Fabula was acquired by Twitter uh, two years ago. And uh, that's where I currently had a group that does research on GraphML. And as you can imagine, uh, graphs are one of the, the main data assets for Twitter. And uh, they appear in many different forms, whether it's the follow graph, the engagement graph, and other graphs that might not be publicly exposed. But if you ask me to pick just one application where I believe uh, geometric deep learning will really be transformational, and we start to see the early signs that this is probably the case, I think these are biological sciences, in particular design of new drugs and therapies, which as you know, is extremely expensive and long business. Uh, I think that the current estimates for bringing a new drug to the market is about a decade of time and about $2 billion uh, investment. And one of the reasons that uh, there are many different stages that, that are extremely costly and uh, the, the level of scrutiny that, that, that new substances undergo is, uh, is uh, excruciating. So it is interesting to look at this problem as a kind of screening. So we start with a huge search space where we have something like 10 to the power of 60 potentially synthesizable molecules, but very few substances that, that we can actually test in the clinic. So this uh, huge gap has to be uh, bridged computationally and graph neural networks uh, have achieved an extremely promising position in this virtual pipeline to, to, to try to predict properties of uh, potential candidates, identify potential uh, drug candidates that can then be optimized by maybe more traditional methods. And last year, the group of Jim Collins at MIT uh, used graph neural networks in a virtual screening pipeline that, that predicted antibiotic activity of different molecules. And they showed that they can discover new uh, antibiotic com compounds that can deal with uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. And uh, it is a crucial uh, problem of modern healthcare. And if the, the coronavirus pandemic has shown anything, it's just a demo version of what might happen if uh, there is a new strain of bacteria that is resistant to, to the, the modern arsenal of antibiotics. So this is interesting, actually, uh, well, I, I work at Imperial College where antibiotics were invented. I hope that, that Imperial College will enter the history as a place where the new generation of methods that, that allow to design uh, new antibiotics uh, will, uh, will, 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 will be born uh, 100 years after uh, Sir Alexander Fleming. So uh, it is also interesting to look at the, the, the traditional drugs that are small molecules. So they are discovered or designed in a way that they uh, bind to their targets. And typically these targets are proteins that have some kind of pocket-like uh, uh, structure. So if you think of, uh, of uh, a typical molecule of a protein, it will have deep pockets into which your, uh, your drug will enter. It will chemically attach itself and uh, it will do something that, that will create a desirable theoretic effect. And uh, unfortunately, this is not uh, always the case and many potential theoretic targets are proteins or uh, interactions between proteins, what is called PPI, protein-to-protein -protein interactions that have flat interfaces. So they don't look like a pocket. They look like a rather boring flat surface. And uh, usually these um, PPI targets are considered to be undruggable by standard small molecules. And one of the famous examples, it's uh, the, the mechanism of program death. That, that is, it's a protein complex. Uh, it was uh, awarded the, the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2018. It is used in cancer uh, immunotherapy by basically by triggering the, the immune system to recognize uh, uh, cancer cells as uh, legitimate targets. And this is done by blocking one of these proteins in this complex, uh, it's called PD-1, PDL one And uh, it can be done by, uh, by a molecule that is a protein itself. So the drug is a protein. And such drugs are called uh, uh, biologics or biological drugs. Typically there are small uh, proteins, peptides or large proteins like antibodies. And there are already several of them on the market. So if uh, having a certain type of cancer a, a decade ago would be a certain death sentence, nowadays uh, these cancers can be cured. So there has been a lot of progress. And uh, a key question here is how to design new proteins with certain properties. For example, a protein that binds to a target. And uh, with my collaborators at the PFL, the group of uh, Bruno Correa, we showed that uh, geometric deep learning architectures could be used uh, as a pipeline to, to, to predict properties of such uh, uh, protein molecules. And uh, uh, our paper appeared uh, on the cover of Nature Methods uh, last year. <clears throat> 
So another interesting direction that uh, is really promising towards uh, cheaper and faster therapies uh, is drug repositioning. When uh, you don't develop a new molecule, you take an existing one that is safe, that was approved, and you try to identify new targets for it, or maybe use it in combination with other molecules uh, uh, to, in attempt to achieve a synergistic effect. This is what is called combinatorial therapy or polypharmacy. And uh, many such drug combinations uh, are actually have a known effect. Some of the, the collateral effects uh, can be uh, extremely harmful. So graphene networks have been uh, used to try to predict the, the side effects of these combinatorial therapies. And uh, I think Marin Kazitnik in her lecture, I think tomorrow, will be talking about some of the, the, the groundbreaking uh, work that she has been doing in this field. Uh, I should say that, that I myself, I was involved uh, in a project where we try to take this idea to the domain of food uh, rather than synthetic drugs. So this is a big collaboration that is uh, led by Kirill Besokov at Imperial College uh, from the Faculty of Medicine in collaboration with Vodafone Foundation and uh, uh, some of the organizers of Logamel, uh, 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 Guada Gonzalez, uh, is uh, one of the, the students working on this project. So uh, we call this hyperfood. So, so we, you, you know that many uh, plant-based food ingredients uh, contain uh, chemical compounds that, that at least in principle belong to the same chemical classes as anti-cancer drugs, for example, or other drugs as well. And uh, most of these molecules are completely unknown, right? So they are not tracked by regulators. You will not see them on food package. So uh, when, you, you, when you buy uh, your packaged food at the supermarket, you will see the, the content of proteins, fats, carbohydrates, vitamins, microelements. You will not see anything about the content of, I don't know, polyphenols, flavonoids, or indoles, right? So this is really the dark matter of nutrition. And what we try to do in this project is uh, to look at the effect of these molecules on, uh, on PPI networks, on uh, basically, they, when they enter our body, they react with proteins, and this, uh, uh, the, the, this, this effect propagates through the network. So it has some kind of ripple network effect. And we can train a classifier that is based on a graph neural network that allows us to predict, for example, anti-cancer properties of uh, such molecules. Now, I'm hugely oversimplifying here. So it, there was a, a big biological component to, to actually convince uh, an expert in this field that, that uh, the, 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 the molecules that we are predicting actually make sense biologically, right? They affect certain pathways that are related to, for example, to, to oncogenesis. They are not toxic and so on, but long story short, we created this map of about 250 different food ingredients uh, based on the content of these potentially cancer beating molecules. And uh, the, the prominent champions in this uh, food map, we call them hyperfoods. So, uh, examples are tea, citrus, cabbage, celery, sage. So, very common, cheap, and boring uh, ingredients that, that might be a good idea to add to your diet. And uh, the cool part of this project was that the ingredients we identified were used by uh, chefs that incorporated them uh, in uh, creative recipes. And here you can see the, the famous Italian chef Bruno Barbieri that uh, designed recipes for last Christmas based on antiviral uh, compounds that we identified in foods. And if you wonder why he is in bed and in his pajamas, because this was part of a Vodafone uh, uh, citizen science campaign called Dream Lab, we collaborated with them uh, to use the idle power of smartphones at night to make uh, these computations and to use it as a kind of distributed computing platform. So I think this is really a tasty note that is probably a good moment to end this lecture. And uh, I'm anyway almost out of time. So uh, we started with uh, the Erlangen program, the history of geometry. We tried to imitate it in machine learning, trying to derive different deep learning architectures from fundamental principles of symmetry and invariance. And we've seen a very broad spectrum of applications from classifying cats and dogs to molecular gastronomy and building uh, dishes that might help you prevent cancer. And there are all instances of a common blueprint of geometric deep learning. So it's really a powerful principle uh, arriving, uh, uh, allowing you to derive uh, new architectures potentially never uh, existed before for specific problems from uh, basic symmetry, uh, symmetry principles and uh, uh, defined for specific domains.
And uh, geometric deep learning uh, methods, in particular uh, deep learning on graphs, have become extremely popular. Petr Vilishkovich calls the, them now the, the first class citizens of ML. There are multiple success stories in industrial applications. And uh, I think it's indicative that, that these methods uh, were featured on the cover of um, two major biological journals, uh, Cell and uh, Nature. And uh, I think it already means that, that these methods have become mainstream and will possibly lead to new, interesting and exciting results in fundamental sciences. So I will end with uh, acknowledging my amazing collaborators in uh, many of these projects. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be very glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Michael, for the question, for the uh, great talk. Uh, so I invite everyone to turn on the camera if they wish to do so. And uh, I think we have time to uh, ask a few questions. So the first question from the audience is from my co-organizer, Daniel. Uh, from a pure math point of view, are there any conjectures or pure math open problems in the field? Yeah, there are plenty of, uh, uh, plenty of open problems. Uh, so let's talk about graph neural networks, right? So uh, a lot of work uh, is done on the expressive power of graph neural networks. Very little is known about the, the generalization capabilities of graph neural networks. So you can uh, you can um, you can show the equivalence between uh, a GNN and the vice Ferrer Lehman uh, algorithms, right, or the hierarchy of the vice Ferrer Lehman uh, uh, algorithms. But uh, in a sense, it's uh, it is almost obvious because it's easy to do. But uh, is it the right way of thinking of uh, similarity between graphs? Right. So we never really have uh, isomorphic graphs. So we, we, we probably what we want is some form of a distance that, that tells us uh, how two graphs are similar. So it would be probably better to the way to think of graphs as uh, discretization of some continuous space. And uh, there we can use standard techniques in, uh, in approximation theory to say that when, how far two graphs are from each other. And uh, there are many interesting uh, works in um, uh, what is called network geometry, where you can think of certain classes of graphs, such as scale-free graphs, as uh, sampling of uh, 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 spaces with hyperbolic geometry. So uh, this is very interesting, and it's also interestingly related to, to uh, nonlinear diffusion equations that you can define on these spaces. So we have a recent ICML paper that interprets graph neural network as uh, neural PDEs. And you can think of a graph and uh, try to answer the question, what is the right graph to the message passing as a form of discretization of this continuous space. So you can interpret positional encoding as a way of representing the graph and rewinding the graph as the form of uh, uh, spatial derivative in this non-Euclidean uh, PD. Great. So uh, I will take a second question. So the second question is, uh, I will reformulate a little bit. Uh, so we talked, you talked a little bit about uh, graph rewiring and um, expressivity of graph networks and uh, would graph rewiring be a possible solution in terms of rewiring the input graph to circumvent the problem of uh, differentiating between isomorphic subgraphs or graphs? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think uh, somehow the field of graph neural networks has, uh, has come to, to realization that message passing that is, uh, well, extremely natural and extremely intuitive is limited in its capabilities. So I think one of the trends nowadays is to go beyond message passing. And it, it takes uh, multiple forms. One of them to, is to incorporate higher order structures. So for example, you can do uh, uh, message passing on simplicial complexes or cell complexes. So we had uh, uh, two recent papers uh, 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 in this direction as well. So uh, you can show that it's uh, strictly more expressive than the, the device for Lehman algorithm. I, I think it's just uh, the, the, the beginning of this, uh, of this direction. So there are many interesting results in, in computational topology that, that can be uh, applied here. And I think what deep learning, it's not, it's not a new field that exists for, for, for at least uh, 30 years, I think now. But what deep learning uh, gives the, the new flavor is that you can uh, create an end-to-end -end architecture that, that you can uh, basically can use uh, uh, in a differentiable way that, that for, for some downstream task. Okay, so I uh, will take a third question from the audience. So um, uh, Sarah Anner says, thank you for introducing concepts of symmetries. Would the next step be to be independent of the data representation? Uh, which, as you know, is a question that is uh, close to my heart. Uh, 
For example, in the context of manifolds, the chosen mesh discretization is only one of the many possible discretizations. Yeah, it's a good question. So I think that that, that that would be the ideal situation, right? And that's why I don't like graphs. I think in GNNs, or at least in some settings, you want to get rid of the graph. So you want to be independent on the specific graph. And that's, I think, graph rewiring what it tries to do. So you want some notion of uh, some continuous object and the graph adjusts adjust the representation of it, some, 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 some discretization, same way as you, if you have a continuous surface, a manifold, and you discretize it in many different ways. One interesting possibility to, to look at it uh, is probably resorting to the formalism of functional maps, where you can think of your mesh, right, or your graph as an operator. Right, so think of, for example, the Laplacian that is constructed uh, that is constructed from from, from the mesh, and uh, th then you can express the, the uh, relation between uh, two meshes using a functional map that, that is a linear transformation between, let's say, Fourier coefficients on uh, in one space and in another space, and uh, you can think of it as a generalization of uh, of uh, bijective correspondence, right? Permutation, so you can generalize permutation invariance to so some some uh, more uh, broad notion of, of continuous invariance. In this case, you can think of it as, as an orthogonal transformation. So uh, we had a paper also with, uh, with the students of Justin Solomon uh, two years ago, where we touched a little bit on this topic, but I think it deserves a, a deeper exploration. Okay, and I think we'll take a final question before having a short break. Uh, Adarsh asks, should we study adversarial perturbations in context of geometric graph learning, for example, by poisoning the graph structure um, and so on? So like, uh, what is your view on adversarial perturbations and adversarial learning? Well, adversarial perturbations in this case, and examples in graph uh, learning. Yeah, excellent question. So let me first talk about perturbations and then about adversarial noise. So uh, perturbations, I think this is in general a very interesting question because uh, this uh, assumption that we have a, a perfect symmetry that can be modeled as a group is obviously wishful thinking, right? So even in images, when we have translational uh, invariance or equivariance, think of a video where you have two objects, one moves left and another moves right. So you don't have a global trans translation that, that uh, uh, relates to frames of this video. So in this case, what will make sense to, to, uh, to generalize these uh, symmetries in the form of some automorphisms some map mapping from domain to itself that, that is sufficiently close to a group, right? So you can measure some form of energy, let's say some, some smoothness, right? Dirichlet energy, uh, which in case it, if it's zero, then it's pure translation, but if it's non zero, then you're close enough. And what was shown by Joan Bruna and Stefan Malar, already old paper on scattering networks, is that uh, actually convolutional networks are not only exactly. Uh, uh, translation equivalent to translations, they're also stable under such smooth deformations. So uh, this is a very important property. For example, Fourier transform doesn't have this, this property. So in Fourier transform, if you think uh, it is invariant under shift, you can take the magnitude of Fourier transform and uh, the, the, the shift become, is encoded as a complex phase that, that taking absolute value removes. But if I just slightly deform my signal, so if it's not a pure shift, but slight, slight stretching, then I can get an uh, error for the one, right? So wavelets, for example, uh, are geometrically stable. So this is very important that, that uh, it's not only uh, exact in, uh, invariance or equivariance, but uh, it also generalizes to these to these approximate situations. Now, adversarial perturbations on graphs. I think there is a, a lot to do there, and it's an interesting class of problems because they have, uh, uh, unlike perturbations in images, for example, it's uh, both combination of discrete and continuous structures, right? So you can perturb the graph, you can also perturb the features. And um, the, it, it's a very uh, uh, new field. I think the first works were done by, by Stefan Gunemann a couple of years ago, and um, there, are, there are many works uh, uh, that have been done recently in this direction. So I think it's, uh, it's a lot to be, to, be, to be done and to be said. Great. Uh, so thank you very much, Michael, for the keynote and for answering all the questions. I think we now will take a short break of five minutes. And the next keynote is uh, Professor Ulrike Tillman, and Daniel will be the chair. So uh, we can uh, thank Michael for the talk and clap if you.